Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's talk about fire and how we manage it in Victoria. First of all, um, we would like to acknowledge the many First Peoples of the area now known as Victoria and honour their continuing connection to and caring for country. And we support traditional owner co-management of parks and public land. Um, and I wanted to invite everyone to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands um, and the traditional, um, and sorry, the first peoples of the area from wherever you are joining us in from tonight, whether you know the names or you don't. Uh, so just, yeah, take a moment to acknowledge that in your own way. So thank you for joining us all tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, Phil Ingemeld, BNPA's long-standing campaigner, will be leading the fire discussion and will cover um, important topics such as history, management and reflect on important contributions from individuals to progress our understanding and improve the management of fire across our landscape here in Victoria. So Phil will share his knowledge in a presentation format for around 45 minutes. So Phil Ingemels has worked in the field of environmental education for, as he puts it, longer than he cares to remember. He is a founding member of the Victorian government's Land and Fire Stakeholder Roundtable, which was set up to encourage community engagement after the fires of Black Saturday. Phil has worked for the BNPA on a number of park management and other land management issues over the last decade or more. So uh, a warm welcome to Phil. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Shannon, and uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks for, for joining in. Um, it's a difficult issue, the fire issue, as I'm sure people uh, know that, and I just um, uh, want to acknowledge that, that this is a, that, that there are many facets to this subject, and I'm going to do my best to work through some of them that we think, I think, are very important. Um, so first of all, I like, I mean, this is Wilson's Promontory, um, as many of you are familiar with it, but it's not always like that. Um, I, uh, this is Wilson from on a not such good day. Um, and I just do want to acknowledge the courage of the many firefighters and volunteer and professionals who are tasked with fighting increasingly severe bushfires in Victoria. Um, we're going to look at some of the questions. How can we manage the increasing frequency and severity of bushfires in Victoria caused by climate change? Um, and climate change is, is one of the great drivers here, obviously. Um, and how can we increase public safety and at the same time manage impact on Victoria's great natural heritage? And there are many other questions as well. In the course of this presentation, we'll be taking a brief look at Victoria's natural history, meet a few of the many people who have contributed to understanding of fire in Victoria, and there are many. Um, so we certainly won't be covering everybody there and suggest some useful changes in fire risk policy and management and outline the need for independent oversight of fire management in Victoria. And that's our last point, and I, I will come to that, obviously, as we go through this process. This is the leaf of a myrtle beech tree, a nothophagus tree in Victoria. Um, and it's an ancient rainforest plant. Myrtle beech exists in Victoria, it exists in New Zealand, it exists in South America, and there are fossil plants of myrtle beech in the Antarctic. And the reason for this is that basically Myrtle Beach evolved um, along with a whole lot, many other um, plants, which we have rainforest plants in particular in this area here in Gondwana, that's Australia, when they were linked to Gondwana, that's Antarctica, that's India, Africa and South America. And beech trees and the plants that accompany them are found either in these countries or in fossils. They evolved about 70 million years ago. Um, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs became extinct and small mammals appeared or became more prominent when the dinosaurs went. And basically since that time, in that whole time that these beach forests have existed, we have evolved. It's a vast period of time. And um, uh, these forests are, are, are remnants from that time ago. 50 million years ago, Australia broke free. Um, 
and it brought this forest with us, with the with not just the trees, but the understory of primitive plants, um, liverworts here, largely in lichens and mosses and club mosses, various ancient plants that are, that are in that process. This is a Myrtle Beach rainforest today in Victoria, um, and and the ferny, mossy, wet understory today. It survived, even though when Australia broke free fire spread across the landscape. Um, and uh, the Australian flora has largely evolved through fire. Um, and either, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a fire related landscape. So fire itself is not the enemy of the bush. Some plants only appear, say this one after the 2003's fire. Um, it's uh, and you can see the, the burnt understory there. It's rare in Victoria and hardly ever appears until fire comes. The other plants, the grasses and the um, uh, royal grevillea here on Mount Buffalo and other places, um, they've also changed and evolved through fire in various ways, and it's, and it's a complex thing. And basically, the landscape we mostly know is a fire related landscape, um, but it's a complex one. Eucalypts have strategies for dealing with fire. They, 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 most of them sprout from the trunk. And when that's given the plant some energy to make a new crown, they, they lose those, that, those epicormic shoots. And this is Mitchell River National Park. It's, it's a, as I say, this is a fire, a fire evolved landscape in various ways. And animals have, they don't like fire obviously, but the, um, they've nevertheless evolved to live with this landscape. They relate to this typically Australian landscape. On, on the right here, there is a what's sometimes called a town hound hall tree where yellow belly gliders meet at night, hang out, eat a whole lot of sap and do whatever else they might do. Not all eucalypts have recovered in the same way. This is Mount Buffalo National Park with the burnt snow gums and the younger ones recovering from fire. Snow gums generally don't sprout on their trunks after fire, they will the, the above ground tree will die and they will, they will re-sprout from an underground growth there. And um, this is an old, presumably burnt snow gum um, with the young snow gum uh, growing up. It's the same tree, um, but it's replacing that thing. And it's a slow process. The thing about snow gums is that they can only handle so much regrowth. They can't handle frequent fire because it weakens them. Other plants, grass trees, there are many types of grass trees in Victoria, and they're known to respond well to fire. Many of them generally flower most commonly, if only, if not only after fire. It's not all the same. These are grey grass trees on the right here, um, now rare in Victoria. And these are ancient trees, and you can see very clearly that they've had no fire in that time. But you can also see the remains of a flower spike up the top here, um, that they flower without fire. Um, um, but they are currently threatened in Victoria. I want to go back to our rainforest, these ancient forests. Basically what they did is that they sheltered from fire or they well, didn't actually move there, but the areas where they were in the deep valleys managed to escape fire over this very long, largely escape fire over this very long period of time. I say again, it's the entire history of our evolution from small mammals. That looks like they're scattered there, that, but they're obviously um, seem like reasonably big areas, but it's actually not like that. So if we go to the right hand side here, take that part of Victoria here, we're going to that little spot here. This is where the largest area of rainforest in Victoria is on, largely on the Irinundra Plateau and in the valleys leading up to it, our cool temperate rainforest. There are many types of rainforest in Victoria, broadly broken up into cool temperate and warm temperate rainforest in the, in the green here, again in these, in these, in these small valleys. This is some cool temperate rainforest on the Arunundra Plateau. Sassafras is the tree. There are others, olive berry and various other things and an understory of ferns and mosses and rippling streams. Beautiful areas. This is Victoria's southernmost bit of rainforest, Wilson's Promontory National Park, warm temperate rainforest. Not so much here, but typically with draped lounges and vines, more like a, a northern New South Wales or... And they're a big tourist attraction. People love them. I'll just put that in. This is, um, but unfortunately, this is the Mackenzie Creek Rainforest in Eskipsland, which was 
suffered heavily under fire, as did many areas of rainforest in the fires of, of the Black Summer, the summer before last. The fire took out a lot of rainforests and greatly damaged them. We know a lot about plants and how they respond to fire. And uh, very rough approximations have been made by DELP and by, by other people based on the knowledge that they do have a fire recovery. And this is just a couple of examples. In Box Ironbark Forest here, which is the forest of central Victoria around the gold fields, they say that it might be good to have a fire every 150 years because by that time, um, that things may senesce and not, may not recover without the stimulus of fire. But a high severity fire you wouldn't want in less than 30 years and a low severity fire you wouldn't want in less than 12 years. These figures are contentious and they come with a whole lot of caveats, but it's just a rough estimate to enable intelligent fire management, if you like, in the state. Mountain ash, our tallest plant, the tallest, the tallest flowering plant in the world, is easily killed by fire above and below ground. It dies. It reseeds um, from very rapidly from after fire, from seed falling on the ground. This is a, what our ash forest once looked like before we logged most of them and, uh, and, and burned a lot of the rest. A very damp, ferny understory. Uh, they say that a fire should happen every 300 years. A high severity fire, not, not 400, should, shouldn't happen before our 80 years between fires. The reason being it takes that long to regrow trees that are rich in seed and, and also the maintenance of the, of the understory. And even a low severity fire shouldn't be for, for, for 80 years. And these come from um, department figures that they change from time to time. Grassland is much more resilient. This is Ter Terry National Park. It doesn't always look like this, I have to say. Grasslands can have, handle fires very frequently, and they very much relate to, to the story of Indigenous burning. Not really up to me to say what Indigenous burning is. Obviously, I'm not I'm not Aboriginal, but the um, from the heritage. But the um, I just go to a few references. One is um, Dr. Beth Gott, an ethnobotanist and a, a very wonderful lady. She's now now very old. She researched. Um, Talk, talk, by talking to Aboriginal people, by talking to fire ecologists, by um, particularly to Aboriginal elders and particularly the women, to get an, an understanding of how Aboriginal fire and culture worked. She made it very clear that things like there are many lilies that they have the tubers of, the vanilla lily here, and orchids, uh, many different types of orchids um, with different fire responses and different digging responses. It's not hard to understand that she came to the conclusion that the way Aboriginal people treated the land was careful and it was knowledge built up over a long period of time and passed on. Very recently, a, a coalition of Victorian traditional owners working with also with the Environment Department of Parks Victoria have published a cultural fire strategy. A lot of Aboriginal burning trials are taking place. And they sum it up as basically it's a process of right fire at the right time in the right way and for the right cultural reasons. It would be hard to argue with that, I think. Another interesting thing uh, a, a book, um, has been written recently. Unfortunately, Ron Hately died at the time it came out. And uh, he questioned the idea that, or didn't, he, he had always taught, he was a teacher at the Creswick Forestry School, and all his life he had taught as the historical record, the white historical record showed that Victoria was a wide open country with a grassy understory. Um, that's what it was once, what it was like. But he checked it out and he got his students to help him check it out and look at the, look at the, the most records he could find. And it's a really interesting book. It's no longer available in the bookshop, but you can get it online. There's two quotes I just put out, they're very early ones. So one in 1802 near Arthur's seat, Port Phillip, this, this commander of the Lady Nelson. This is about 30 years before any skerrick of Melbourne appeared on, on, on the, at the top of the bay. The trees that are a good distance from each other and no brush intercept you. Virtually the same area near Arthur's seat, um, where, um, they walked to Western Port and this is for the commander of a ship, the ocean. 
We came to an immense forest of lofty gum, lofty gum trees and an almost impenetrable jungle of prickly shrubs bound together by creeping plants. This is very much at the time with no European influence on the country at all. And he has many such quotes out of both and, and a whole range of things. It was a complex landscape. Um, the pre euro landscape was a complex one. It wasn't, wasn't a, a, any, any way a uniform one. And the other way to look at this, and I think it's an important one to realise, um, this is a map of the broad vegetation types in Victoria pre-occupation. It shows um, up here the, uh, in this area is the Mallee, the, the, the sands of the Mallee, the pink of the blue along here is the river red gum forest along the Murray River. These are the box ironbark forests where I talked about the, the um, different fire regimes. But importantly, this, the very light color here are wide open grasslands and the slightly faint, less not so faint green is that color here are open grassy woodlands. Then we've got the tall forest in green and this part here is the, is the alpine region. That's a pre-European um, landscape. And I just want you to particularly take note, I go there again, the grasslands and the grassy woodlands um, in those, those two light colors. That's where we are now, everything else has been cleared. So the great majority of that cleared land is now farmland and a whole lot of other land is now farmland as well. Now that doesn't, certainly doesn't mean that Aboriginal burning didn't happen in other parts of the landscape. I'm absolutely sure I, it would be most surprising if it didn't. But I think it has to be, we have to, it's just good to, to note that point, I think. The other thing I want to make is in that broad range of ecosystem types, is that we have roughly inherited somewhere around 100,000 native species in Victoria through that evolutionary process. We often think of the vertebrates, the birds and the mammals and so on, but um, you know, you know that, that's what we mainly think about with conservation. There are about 670 different species and the trees and the shrubs and the wildflowers and so on, the other thing we most often think about, about 4,300 species. But the non-vascular plants, which are quite often things in the, in the rainforest gullies and so on, 2,500 of them. Fungi, 15 to 30,000, no one really knows. And invertebrates, um, the insects, the snails and the crayfish and things like that, 50 to 80,000 species. Um, we've got a lot to look after and um, that requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding if we're going to muck around with the landscape or not muck around, that's probably the wrong word to do, if we're coming to manage it. Some of these things are not well known to everybody, but they're well studied orchids. That's a very small gnat orchid. Some invertebrate presumably lives in this classy little house. I have no idea what it was and I've shown this slide in many talks and no one's ever been able to tell me what it is. Maybe somebody knows and I'd love to know. But the point is, there's a whole, there are just so many things that we do know, we, we know nothing about, and we don't understand, and we've got a lot of learning to do, and we'll be learning for a very long time. I just want to move on now to a gentleman called um, Judge Leonard Stretton. He was commissioned to look at the cause of fire after the 1939 Black Friday, which were tragic across Victoria. He was a highly respected judge and a very careful man. And he made this statement amongst many, um, that basically the, the graziers in the high country um, used fire to encourage green pick for their cattle. But the more that fire was, but the more they did that, the scrub grew and flourished and fire was used to clear it and the scrub grew faster, thicker, bush fires caused by the, and the shrubs themselves are, are fire prone. So he says the bushfires caused by the careless and designing hand of man raised through the forests. This was a very contested thing at the time and it was a fairly, you know, it was a hard call. But we know now that it's 
that fire and disturbance does bring shrubs into the high country. Um, and it's certainly uh, after the 2003 fires, there's been extensive shrub growth through the high country on the, on the otherwise grassy plains. But we also know that when these shrubs senesce, when they die off, um, that grassy plain grows through there, that the, the long unburnt country is less flammable. I want to go to this landscape. This was one which photograph taken by um, Jenny Barnett, a, a member of the a staff member of the VMPA, near her home. Long unburnt, 24 years since the fire, very little fuel in the landscape. It exploded on Black Saturday on the, in the fierce weather conditions. And sadly, um, Jenny Barnett and her husband died in that fire with their neighbours. Um, she was a great researcher on, on, on many issues and also on fire. And she made a submission two years before she died to the parliamentary inquiry into bushfires in Victoria. And she spoke to that submission. They asked her to speak to it in, the, in, the, in that parliamentary inquiry, but her submission was largely ignored. And so I just want to go through some of the things she said because she was worth listening to. <laughs> and if she hadn't died, she'd be giving this talk, quite frankly. Her submission is now in this seat, which is a memorial to Jenny and her husband, John, and neighbour biologist, Leon Charmian Ahern. And that seat is a time capsule and her submission is in that seat, but rather than waiting to when that might be opened, I'm just gonna give some quotes from Jenny. One is that fuels will be reduced in the short term after a burn. But within three to four years, um, wattles and other plants will appear. And that'll be followed by a steady decline. So you're actually, after a few years, you get this uh, increase in fuel levels. And this was from her own observations, but this has been well now observed now. She also said that fire can actually increase the, 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 the existence of flammable shrubs that they morph, that they, the, the flammable plants, the plants that have evolved who like fire, uh, understandably, the plants that can attract fire. And this is a growth a few years after a fire, four years after a fire in near Castle Maine, where you get a thick growth of Cassini, growth of Cassinia, known locally as kerosene bush. Um, can scarcely be called fuel reduction burning. And there are many instances. This is another one from the Castle Maine area, which was in our magazine. Um, the same, the same sort of result. These are all observations um, and thing, but uh, there wasn't any really for whatever uh, the common observations by park managers and all sorts of people, but um, it nevertheless wasn't seriously challenged until the agencies of the, um, the, the park management agencies of um, Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT commissioned then Dr. Zilstra to um, do a study of um, the fire history of the Australian Alps, not just in the high country, but at all levels. And he came to the conclusion that across the Australian Alps, recently burnt forests have been, have been on average more flammable than mature forests. That is that you have, after fire, you might have a brief lack of understory, then you get increased understory. And as it matures, it becomes less flammable. Uh, he's now an adjunct professor at Curtin University in Western Australia, and together with a few other professors, um, Hopper, Bradshaw, and Lindemeyer, made a submission to the inquiry into the Black Saturday fires. And this graph was used. Basically, this is um, flammability up here, flame height up there from the shrubs, and this is um, years since fire. That basically you have, immediately after fire, you, you have very low fuel. But for the next 20, 25 years or so, you have an increased, uh, and the story of increased flammability that can generate a higher flame height until you have a long-term sentence um, without that. And essentially, if you keep burning the forest, either through climate change, through wildfires, which is the, the problem we've got now, uh, or and if you're adding to that through trying to, try, trying to relentlessly um, uh, apply fuel reduction as well, uh, burns as well, you end up maintaining our forest, roughly speaking, in that time zone. 
maintaining it in a high fuel level. And this is the situation we're in now with very little long arm burnt forest in the state. So it's an understand, it's an, it's a, this is an, being objectively, to objectively look at that, um, it, I think is really important to challenge it, if you like, but to, but to look at that objectively. Fire roars through the, the Malpine and, and um, mountain ash forests. And this is the regrowth here a few years afterwards. Um, th these things happen in many forest types. And more recently, in a report into the Black Saturday fires, the Inspector General for Emergency Management said that even with an extensive fuel management program, bushfire risk remains and increases as the vegetation regrows. The understanding of this is, is increasing. Jenny also pointed out that logging does not reduce that logging doesn't reduce fires. Indeed, dense regrowth logging increases fuel loads. And here we have a the regrowth from logging in the Acheron uh, area. And you notice here these poor little things here. These are the the remnants of the of the Gondwanan understory um, sticking out above this of highly flammable um, young eucalypt regrowth. And often it's often involves young wattles as well. So we're doing a lot of pretty odd things to the landscape, I think. And we have to be very, we have to look at this a bit more carefully. There, there are now many scientific papers pointing this out, that historical and contemporary logging regimes have made many Australian forests more fire prone. And just getting back to our rainforest, even the fire spreading from logged areas have burnt into ancient old growth eucalypts and rainforests dominated by ancient Gondwan and lineages. There's a lot of things you can say about this graph, um, but I'm just gonna do a few. First of all, fires above a million hectares, there's one in 1939, that Black Saturday fire, 63 years later, we had one in 2002, 2003. But in more recent times, we've had three fires over a million hectares in the last 20 years. So that's a climate change. It doesn't prove climate change, but it's consistent with the climate story. There are many other things so I can talk about this graph, but I just want to talk about one thing. We've looked at Aboriginal burning and the whole business of how they learnt through time, through generations, through observation, and um, uh, so that they knew where and when to apply fire. This is about the early 1930s down this end of the left-hand side of the graph. And this is the current time up here. It's about 90 years of records of, uh, the red bits are, I should have said, are, are wildfires and the yellow bits are fuel reduction burning, the levels of them. But in that whole time, 90 years of records of that, there is no record of what happens after a burn. For 90 years, we have failed to record what happens when you burn. Now, I, I can understand that it might be hard to, you know, maybe in the 1930s, you wouldn't have expected that. But in the last 20 years, you certainly would. And we don't have those records either. We do not know in different landscapes what happens when you burn that at that period of time, at that severity. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a great failing, I think, of management. It's a bit like sending people into hospital and not knowing what condition they were in when they came out. That wouldn't happen. Another comment of Jenny's. In relation to this, the department needs to conduct more statistical studies of the effectiveness of prescribed burning in various landscape types. Jenny was sometimes given to understatement, but it's a totally opposite point. Rainforests have a lot of trouble with fire. So does the Alpine region. They can handle fire to a degree, but they can't. The Alpine region has, has a lot of trouble with repeated fire. Um, for a whole number of reasons. And the rare species that live there um, have that trouble as well. Rainforest, I mentioned before, this is a tourist rainforest near Bruthen. Um, in the fires of um, uh, two summers ago, 
it was roasted. Um, that's it today, or oh, that was it shortly after the fire. The, um, and many rainforests were burnt. Rainforests that haven't been burnt for hundreds, thousands, heaven knows how many years were burnt uh, in, in the fire. And for some of them, it was involved um, uh, reburning of, of recently burnt rainforests, you know, 20, 30, 50 years ago, whatever. We could lose um, that, that, that Gondwanan remnant forest that was there when we were a tiny mammal scurrying around in it. Not all control burns are done not carefully, or I'm sure many of them are done very carefully. This is an interesting one. Maybe it didn't need to happen. Didn't, doesn't look like a fuel reduced thing, but it was largely burnt to singe stringy bark trees there because they were known to carry fire into the canopy um, when a fire, should a fire come through, that was done to avoid that. But many of our control burns in the past, in the recent past, haven't been done very well. This is one, I think it was probably a bit, it was a number of years ago now in Grand Pines National Park. That's a control burn. Um, a more recent one in Radar Hill in East Gippsland was a very fierce burn. Um, it destroyed a lot of hollow trees and hollow logs on the ground. Um, and hollows are enormously important for a whole heap of species. They don't just need different types of hollows for each species, they need enough hollows to maintain their population. As an example of how that goes, that's the number of, from the Geelong Field Naturalists, one day put together a list of the number of that need hollows in Brisbane Ranges National Park. Um, as I say, they need a lot of hollows. They need enough hollows of the right sort. This is one interesting um, paper from DELP um, a few years ago, um, looking at into the effect of hollows on fuel reduction burning, the effect of fuel reduction burning on hollows, I should say. The study demonstrated that plan burns in Gippsland increased the collapse rate of hollow bearing trees significantly and are likely to cause the loss of habitat for hollow dependent fauna. But there are many publications like that, even though DELP knows very well that the environment's under stress from frequent fire at the moment. Um, there aren't many studies that are coming out like that. And a recent statement by the Vicarage Auditor General, again, looking into the, into the black summer fires. With the exception of some isolated case studies, DELP does not know the effect of but the native flora and fauna. That's a pretty terrible indictment from the Auditor General and it needs a response. I should add there that the response by DELP to the fires of Black Saturday in recovery was terrific. It was a, one, of the, one of the most impressive things that we've seen for some time. Uh, good funding from the government and a lot of knowledge of independent, and the knowledge of independent scientists used mm -hmm. in the process. But um, the, the background stuff's not there. I just want to change subject slightly. Um, the, uh, to another issue with fire at the moment, and this is certainly since the fire back summer. This is a road near Castle Main, um, which is subject, potentially subject to becoming a fuel reduction, a fuel break. And if that happened there, you can see there's a kind of a ambience tourism issue there. On the left, that's a fuel break done in the process of, um, uh, in, in relation to the uh, fires of Black Saturday and on the right. But basically there's a, there's a whole program going now to, to create fuel breaks across Victoria. And the target for the year ahead, and I think that's actually adding up last year's as well, is 967 kilometers of fuel breaks. But we've been told that there's a potential future target of 5,000 to 7,000 kilometre fuel breaks across Victoria's forests, 20 metres to 40 metres wide. That equates to um, more than twice the distance from Melbourne to Darwin. And in area, it roughly equates to clearing more than half of Wilson's probably one of our largest national parks. And there's currently no program to counterbalance that or to have offsets to, to, to balance that enormous impact on the environment. 
And the efficacy of fuel breaks, certainly in large fires, they're almost useless. Um, they, they can be used to backburn in, in the path of a fire, but backburning itself is highly contentious and often just spreads the area of fire. The, the scale of this program is very big. And I just say it would be pretty sad to see fire breaks being driven by commercial considerations for timber supply. But I think that question has to be raised and I think it has to be answered. A known limited efficacy of, of fuel breaks, particularly in large fires, um, why that's happening. Another statement from Jenny, and these are the options that we have, Jenny. She also said that first strike capability, increasing that was a very useful thing to do. And I couldn't help but agree with that. The, two, the 2020 Royal Commission into the, into the fires also raised the issue of looking seriously at including first attack in the, in, in the thing. Rapid aerial attack at the point of ignition, if you roll that out across Victoria, it would be hugely expensive. It means getting two or three aircraft, light aircraft usually, um, helicopters or whatever, to a point of ignition within 10 to 15 minutes. But a single, if they just stop one single large fire, that can save a billion dollars. So I think that's something that has to be done. I mean, look at this now. This is um, basically Forest Fire Management Victoria, which is the agency within, largely within DELT, the Environment Department, that manages fires, is focused on fuel reduction. That's the tool that they use, and that's where they do. But we need more of issues like ignition control, putting local power generation to stop ignition points, fire bag monitoring, things like that, on the left-hand side at the beginning. And on the right-hand side, impact control, if we're trying to save lives, private bushfire shelters, community bushfire shelter options if necessary, absolutely compulsory evacuation and evacuation planning so that we plan that across the state and improve building regulations. But at the moment, our fire management, the only thing that's ever reported annually on fire management is fuel reduction. Um, and that reporting is done by Forest Fire Management Victoria. Forest Fire Management Victoria assesses the risk to the state. It delivers the risk management and then reports on its own effectiveness. And I think it's time that that changed. It's too serious. It's too serious a thing to have a department within a department, a silo, if you like, um, really largely controlling that whole discussion. And I strongly believe, and the VMPA believes, that effective bushfire risk management will not be achieved in Victoria until we have a skilled, and I highlight that word, independent, that word, integrated fire planning and monitoring body that is separate from the actual delivery of risk abatement. So that we can just absolutely objectively look at how we, how we handle the risk to lives and, and to our environment. This is an aerial photograph of um, part of the Daniel Ranges. Um, I really believe that there is no way on, on earth that that community will be saved by broad scale fuel reduction. After extensive, all of the extensive fuel reduction burning that happened in East Gippsland over the last number of years did absolutely nothing to save Malakuta. Now Malakuta could well have done was a pre-planned, well-understood evacuation plan. They managed it very well um, in the circumstances, but this community, just to save lives, needs private bushfire shelters. It needs fuel reduction in the interface here. And there, there are there's many scientific studies that go to that point, um, that point that out. Um, it needs a really good, well understood evacuation plan, and it would certainly benefit and, um, with, with rapid intervention um, should a fire happen at the point of ignition. We really have, we also have to look at how we do handle the protection of our natural areas, just the things that we love the rare things like that, the things that we just love, 
The things that we don't know much about, the 15,000 fungal species. Do you need 15,000 fungal species? I don't know, but they play important roles in ecosystems, hugely important roles. And we don't really know much about that process. And we don't know much about the maybe 50,000 invertebrate species, large and small, um, that we have in Victoria and that we've inherited over a huge number of years. Um, I think we have to work harder to save our environment and to save ourselves. That um, uh, if we're going to um, really be where we want to be, and of course it wouldn't hurt at all um, to deal with climate change and stuff. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Phil, for sharing your knowledge, um, which yeah has been cultivated over years and years of your hard work um, and yet yeah, have been at the forefront of advocating for fire management in Victoria. So as we've seen from Phil's presentation, fire can be a really complex issue and one which requires really careful planning and management. And to utilise all the knowledge that we know, but also take into account what we don't know 